everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and for being patient while we get started. Um, I just wanted a chance for more people to be able to log in. You know, our days are busy, so sometimes we come a little bit late to these things. Um, but I think it's 102, so we're going to go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Um, first of all, my name is Maggie Flynn, and I work as an international coordinator in the ASU Study Abroad Office. I'm joined today by my colleague, Barbara Young, who is a program manager with our office. There's Barbara. And um, you want to introduce, introduce yourself? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm just saying hi there. I'll be on uh, the chat, so feel free to chat questions throughout the session today. Yeah, so we, cause we're going to have just like a discussion. It should feel informal for you, um, highlighting some of the awesome experiences of our first generation study abroad alumni. Um, but should you have a question along the way, feel free to drop it in the chat. Barbara will get to that, or um, we can always uh, save it for the Q and A session at the end. So before I turn it over to our awesome alumni here to join us because they're the stars of the show, uh, a few housekeeping items. One is please remain muted just to help uh, minimize distractions during the call. You are more than welcome to turn on your cameras. I see some of you doing that. It is always nice to speak to faces instead of um, blank screens, so thank you. Um, secondly, we are recording, so if you'd like a copy of this afterwards, we're happy to send that out to you. And then, you know, last but not least, our alumni are here to share their experiences. Um, and they're those students who have been in your shoes. They are first generation students who came to ASU and decided, I also want to study abroad, even though it was such an achievement just to come to ASU, they took it another step further. So they're just here to share their experiences, um, help make you feel more confident in your decision to study abroad, and just help you know how we're all here to support you as you make these plans. So, Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to them for introductions. I will have Marie start with uh, her name and major and where she went. Hi everyone, um, I'm so excited to be here and talk about study abroad with you all. Um, my name is Marie and I am a senior and my major is global studies and I'm minoring in two things, French and nonprofit management. Um, and the study abroad program that I went on was ISA service learning um, in Meknes, Morocco. Thank you. Morocco is on my list of places to go. Have not been there yet. Um, how about Rebecca? I know I saw her join us here. Hi guys, my name is Rebecca. Um, I'm also a senior here at ASU. So I'm a biochem major with a psychology minor. Um, I guess it's also important to know I'm pre-med for any of you who are. And the program that I went on was just a normal exchange program. And I went to New Zealand, um, a little town called Hamilton. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I also want to let you know, we do have a third uh, alumni joining us. Her name's Anna. She is actually at work right now, but she's going to take a break and hop on uh, about 125, 130. So when she does, I'll turn things over to her as well. But Rebecca, Marie, thank you so much for being here. Like I said, you guys are the stars of the show, sharing your experiences. Um, so we're really happy to have you. And I also want to just, you know, mention for everyone on this call that you can tell both Rebecca and Marie did, um, they may have mentioned they did semester long programs. That is not the only type of program we offer. We have short programs like spring break, winter break. We have programs where you can go for the entire year, it really runs the gamut. Um, but these are just two examples. So let's get started with the planning process, like how you went about this. Um, Marie, can you talk about what made you select your program and what resources you consulted to uh, make that decision? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as a global studies uh, major, part of our major track is to study abroad. So it was kind of on my mind um, coming into the program. And also I just have always wanted to travel. So I was very excited to just start diving in and, and looking at the different programs. Um, a tool that I really just started pulling up and going through a lot was just a study abroad page um, that ASU has, just going through all the different programs they have. And I think there's so much information that they kind of compile already for you. So they can match it up to your major and like the courses they offer and the equivalencies on there. 
Um, but I think when I was looking at a program because I was, you know, wanting to focus on a language, I really was looking at countries that um, offered that language instruction. So Morocco does speak French as well as Arabic. So a lot of students there were focusing on one or the other. Um, cost was another huge factor for me um, as someone, you know, who was um, relying on a lot of scholarships or planning to use scholarships. I had to be really kind of mindful of that as well. Um, and just kind of analyzing the different costs of programs that might have been like in Europe or in France. Um, for me, for, Fran uh, for French or Morocco, um, there was a huge difference there. Um, and then also the classes, just what kind of classes did they offer? Um, I really wanted to focus on like human rights and, and things like that. So just going through and looking um, on, I did a partnership program too. So I had another great uh, resource to go to the website and really just look through all the classes and all the excursions that the program provided. Um, and I also had the fortunate opportunity to talk to students who had previously been on the program before too. So I think that was just a really great resource for me too, um, especially going to Morocco, which is definitely a lot uh, different than, you know, going to maybe somewhere uh, like London that I might've been more familiar with. But I think um, that was just a really great resource is hearing other people's experience and really just reading everything there was to read on the website as well, so yeah. Yeah, we uh, definitely have a lot of information on our website, like Marie said. Uh, we also have different workshops where we present this information because we know it can be uh, a bit overwhelming, you know, to, to navigate that and sift through all of that. So um, if you're ever, if you find yourself doing that and getting a little overwhelmed or intimidated, please feel free to reach out to our office. Rebecca, what made you choose the Waikato Exchange Program in New Zealand? So like Marie said, I relied really heavily on the study abroad website. Um, I actually was considering a different program because I qualified for a study abroad scholarship, um, but it only went to certain programs. So when I was looking on the website, I found out that the program that I qualified for with the scholarship wouldn't transfer back a lot of credits to my major. And it was really important for me to get a lot of those major credits because I still wanted to graduate within my four years. And because I was doing a minor, like if I didn't get a lot of those credits, it wasn't going to work out for me. Um, so that was something I really did was go through, see exactly, you know, what courses were considered like pre-evaluated in course equivalencies. And then once I kind of started thinking about, you know, where I wanted to go, um, I started looking, like Marie said, financial aid, you know, what was it going to cost me? Um, again, my story is really different from Marie because like I don't speak another language. So for me, it was really important to go to like a Western or English speaking country because I don't know any other languages. Um, and then I guess also too, I was looking really heavily into the Gilman scholarship, which I ended up qualifying for. So if you ever look into that, you have to go to a certain like level country. So you can't go anywhere that's considered like dangerous, like they mark what levels you are. So for them, they do try to get you to go somewhere that tends to be like a little like safer. Yeah, there's just so much to consider. And I'm glad you both brought up cost because um, for anyone on this call who has been looking at different programs on our website, you may have seen that we do have cost sheets for each program. So we do try and outline um, what that looks like for you. Rebecca, do you feel like, like what were the challenges that you ran into when trying to sift through programs and choose one? I think for me, what was hard, especially being pre-med, um, I, and I don't know if it's for this, a lot of different like pre like law or a different other tracks, but with pre-med, you have to take all of your requirements for medical school within the U.S. through a U.S. accredited university. So for me choosing a program, I had to make sure that, like I said, the credits would transfer back and that I was able to take credits toward my minor, like the general credits that I needed. Um, so that was really important to me and kind of one of my top things. Also, I was looking specifically toward more exchange programs because I do rely so heavily on scholarships. I knew I'd kind of get like the most for my money in doing it that way because my scholarships would be directly applied. Yeah, thank you for sharing. 
Um, Marie, did you have similar challenges or what do you feel like was some big obstacles you faced in planning? Because it takes a lot of work. Yeah, I would definitely agree with just, I think the biggest challenge for me and that I had to go to probably like five meetings before I left was just the course equivalencies and like the credits transferring. Um, I even really had to follow up when I got back as well. Um, so I was really fortunate that my study abroad person for the department of my major, I had had in a class before and I was familiar with them. Um, so it was really great to just be able to go to their office, but I did go to their office a lot. Um, just making sure that um, the credit was just going to get transferred back um, was something that was a little bit more complicated to navigate. Um, there was lots of paperwork. I did a partnership program, so I did go through an accredited uh, university that was through like Montana, but I was taking classes in Morocco. So it was kind of this complicated thing. Um, and I also did a service learning. So part of my uh, study abroad experience was kind of like uh, is volunteering and it was almost like an internship. So it was kind of trying to capture uh, put that into credit, course credit was also something that I had to navigate as well before I left. And I really wanted to get that nailed down before I left so that when I was there, I wasn't stressing about um, trying to get that figured out when I was in country. Um, but if that's like, don't let that scare you. There's definitely professors who know how to do that stuff. It just might take some extra time to like sit down with them. Um, I think I even talked to, I talked to my advisor, I talked to the professor who's the study abroad person um, for the whole department for global studies. So there's lots of resources for you to use. And um, just, I would just encourage you guys to like have that time and take that time to figure that out before you go. So you're not super worried when you get back. Um, but yeah, I think that was the biggest challenge. And then um, I think something also that I wanted to make sure I got squared away too was just finances. So um, making sure my scholarships um, were processed and filed correctly and making sure that was all good before I went. Um, and that was just really helpful for me too, just going out and knowing confidently that it was all good. Um, and I think I had a couple meetings, even with Maggie, I think I sat down or emailed her like a month before I left. I was like, hey, just want to make sure it's all good. And, um, but yeah, just, don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask for help, even if it's like a repetitive question, because um, ultimately when you leave, you want to feel confident um, that you're good and set wherever you're going. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You guys bring up such good points. And I think it's important to mention too that, again, Rebecca and Marie did semester programs, which take a little bit more planning. But even if you're planning a spring break or summer program, you're still earning credit. So you do still want to make sure you're taking, a, you're going on a program that is going to give you the credit you need it's going to fit into your degree just as you had hoped. Um, so it does take a lot of uh, different parties reaching out to them and making sure that everyone's on the same page. So thank you. Um, considering the planning process, it's not, it's not just you, right? Your family is also involved in this. And so um, Marie, can you talk about the conversations you had with your family and what their opinion was of study abroad and just how that all went? Yeah, for sure. Um, my family was super supportive. Um, I have always, as they knew going into college, like studying abroad was on my list of things to try and do. So they were very excited for me and I'm super blessed that they were on board. And I don't think my mom, like my mom was a little nervous, but she was like, you got this, right? And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, but I definitely, um, with that said, I before I left, I printed out a copy of my whole itinerary for the semester. So she knew my layovers. She knew when I was supposed to be at an airport. She knew because I had travel plans for afterwards as well as that I had made beforehand. So I, I left her a whole packet of everywhere that I could possibly be while I was away. Um, I also like left her a copy of my passport and all of my cards and things. Um, and just like really wanted to make sure that she felt a part of it too. Um, and that was really important to me. And um, making sure that we had a way to stay in contact as well. Um, so for me, that was really easy because we both have iPhones. So I didn't even have to explain to her how to download um, like GroupMe or um, what's the other one? I'm totally blanking, even though I use it all the time. WhatsApp. Um, yes, WhatsApp. So it was really easy for us to stay in communication even before I had to get a new phone number in Morocco. So um, definitely just, you know, telling her, sending her pictures of things that I was doing. Um, and I think that was just the biggest thing is just making sure that she was on the same page as me. So she never really was worried or anything like that. But yeah, I think she was just really excited and really supportive throughout the whole process. So 
Um, she was nervous I was going to Morocco because um, it was, it's an Islamic country and she just had heard stories. Um, there it was like a really tragic story where a couple of years before um, some tourists were traveling from Sweden and they got murdered in the mountains. And so she was like, what are you gonna, like, you have to be careful. And she was a little bit nervous about that. Um, and obviously that was like nerve wracking for me, but I made sure to look into that and talk to people, but I just assured her too, and just made sure that, you know, I was keeping her updated and, and letting her know that I had been doing everything that I could too. So honestly, I can't, there wasn't really a huge, huge issue. She was just excited and confident. And as long as I communicated, it was all good. <laughs> so well, that that's yeah. great. And yeah. <laughs> Clearly you came back safely and you yeah. had a good experience in Morocco. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, how did that go with you and your support network? I guess, I don't know if it's the same with Marie, but I guess I was lucky because even though I'm first generation, I have an older sister who went to college and she actually studied abroad through NAU. Um, so I at least like wasn't the first in my family to have to navigate it. So my family was kind of used to it and kind of like new game plan what to do. Um, and I'm lucky because my aunt, who like is in charge of all my finances, travels a lot for work. So she kind of knows the in and outs of that. Um, so my family, I was lucky, was super supportive, kind of was able to somewhat guide me through the process of like, my aunt was like a really big part of me studying abroad because she was the one with my bank account information. So when I was abroad, I was like, I need you to wire me more money. Like she was the person who was in charge of like sending it to New Zealand to make sure I could like live out there. Um, so I definitely think like, you know, having your family support or at least having a, some sort of support network, like here back in the States is really helpful. Um, my family kind of got worried too, because I actually left for New Zealand a couple of months after the Christchurch shooting happened, which I was on a completely different Island. I was on the North Island and Christchurch is on the South, but like my dad was freaking out, like, oh my gosh, you shouldn't go. Um, like what if something happened when you're out there? but I did the same thing like I taught my family like who didn't know how to use WhatsApp um I was Skyping them like constantly when I was flying to and from New Zealand everyone in my family had the itinerary of like where I, my plane was I'd have to text them like as soon as I landed when I got on I'm like okay I'm boarding like I'll let you know when I land again just like that constant communication so like God forbid, like something does happen to you, A, they're in the loop and they, they can like figure out a plan B, but also just reassuring them that like, you know, I'm okay, like I got this. Um, but yeah, I was lucky that they were so supportive because I definitely had a hard time when I first got to New Zealand with homesickness. So having that network that was like, no, like you wanted to do this, like we're totally for you being out there really helped me to like make sure I stayed there and didn't like back out and come home early. You guys make so many good points. It's hard for me to like follow up on any of those. Um, I mean, the first one I want to say is we both, you both mentioned um, like health and safety incidents that come up in the news and that do happen. And for anyone on this call who hasn't, um, you know, been made aware of this, we have uh, two dedicated staff members to health, safety, and security. So if your parents in the planning process or your support network is in any way concerned, about that, please have them get in touch with our office. We're happy to share those resources, but we're, we would not send you anywhere where we do not feel confident. Um, but I liked how you both mentioned like that your support network can take many forms, right? So it doesn't just have to be your parents. It can be your aunt. It can be a best friend. And it's making them, I think Marie, you said like making them feel a part of your experience and involved. So um, I loved that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with your family. Um, for the time that you're abroad, like, let's dive into that. So I like hearing the fun stuff. So Rebecca, what is like the most memorable or one of the most memorable experiences from your time in New Zealand? Oh, I did so much. Um, I guess some of my highlights is like, w when I was in New Zealand, um, I don't know why, but like the no, the local nightclub held like concerts. And so I got to see uh, Sean Kingston and Jay Sean while I was in New Zealand. So like big moment from my childhood was like seeing them perform live. Um, I, I met like a lot of international students out there. 
So I got to do like some cultural festivals and like learn about different things that like I would have definitely never like learned about, especially like my Indian friends out there. I heard them talking Hindi and like learned so much about like Indian culture and like Bollywood and things like that. Um, but I think definitely like some of the most memorable parts of my experience happened toward the end, just because like that's when I had more free time. So like A, my boyfriend, I flew him out to New Zealand <laughs> during my like spring break while I was out there. So I got to travel like through New Zealand with him. We got to go to Hobbiton. Um, my favorite animals in alpaca. So I went to an alpaca farm twice while I was out there because it was like 20 minutes away from me. And then, yeah, I just like getting to travel. I got to go to Wellington, which is like an eight hour bus ride south. Um, but I think definitely the most exciting stuff happened like the last two days I was there because I decided in the last week, like I'm gonna go solo traveling and I went surfing and bungee jumping like right before I left. Wow, so yeah, you really uh, <laughs> took advantage of your time in New Zealand right before you left, like you're gonna do this. That's awesome. I really, really want to go to New Zealand um, so badly, but Morocco, like I said, is high in my list as well. So Marie, how about you? What really stands out from your time there? Um, I just love Morocco. It's, it was so fun. Um, everyone there thought I was Moroccan. So they would always come up to me and try and speak like Derija or French. And I love that, but it was awkward because I didn't know how to speak that. Um, but um, I think some of my most memorable, uh, memorable experiences, um, I did stay with a home, uh, a host family. So I got to live um, with another student, actually me and her, um, with a host family while we were in Morocco for the semester. And it was just so awesome, just like learning, like just the family traditions and like being a part of that family. We had like a host brother and the host sister and um, we would just spend time together, you know, doing homework at the dinner table or just having dinner together. Every Friday, we'd have like a big family dinner of like couscous and like, it was just so awesome um, being a part of the family there. And um, that was just definitely a huge highlight and takeaway for me. Um, and then just some of the excursions we did were so fun. We went to the Sahara Desert, which was amazing. We were like camelback riding and got to see like all the amazing like giant sand dunes. It was crazy. Um, and that was just so fun and memorable. And um, kind of like Rebecca said, just like meeting people while you're there who are also studying abroad and experiencing these things for the first time with you. It's like you really create those like awesome friendships. So I still have friends like my roommate and just other people who had came on the trip. Um, you know, we're just, we have that forever to like bond over and talk about and um, they became your travel buddies. Um, you know, we, I went to Spain for a weekend. Um, that was super fun. Um, went to Barcelona and I went to France for a weekend. And afterwards, my other friend who was studying abroad, we met up in London. So it was just this whole grand adventure. And it was just so awesome to be able to meet new people and like go on these fun adventures and, um, just really surround yourself with so many awesome new relationships and different cultures was just a huge, huge, awesome highlight for me. So, yeah. That sounds so cool. I love the pictures that students send of them in the desert on Camelback. It just is very, very picturesque. Um, I know we didn't have this on our list of questions, but I'm curious, you both talk about doing so many things outside of the classroom. So can you, but yet you mentioned too about needing to be careful with finances and choosing a program that's within your budget. So um, like Marie, with uh, some of the traveling to Spain that you did, can you talk about how you, how you managed your budget and made sure that you weren't um, going outside of that? Yeah, for sure. I think that is one of the things I wish I had been better at. I wish I had kind of made a little bit more structure for myself. I feel like once I got to Morocco, I just, I wanted to do everything. <laughs> so it was kind of hard to stick to that. But um, one of the really great factors about Morocco is that um, my money went really far there because um, I think it's like, I'm forgetting now, but like $1 is a hundred dirhams in Morocco. So my money went really far when I was staying there. So my expenses in Morocco weren't very high. It was when I went to Europe that I would spend way more money in like a weekend than I would spend for like a month in Morocco. So it just had to be like very careful and like consider that into my budget. Um, going abroad because I did have a lot of scholarships that paid for the program. Um, a lot of my spending money came from my own savings. Um, so I made sure like I knew that traveling was something that I really wanted to do outside of the program itself. So I knew I wanted to, you know, go to Spain maybe once and go to France. So 
um, I really wanted to have those plans kind of cemented before I left. So that way, you know, I could do them and I knew that I had the means to do so. Um, but yeah, I think also just speaking to other students about what they had time to do was a huge factor for me. Um, I had a friend who had studied in Morocco the semester before me and she took a lot of classes. She took maybe like 21 credits and I think I only took 12. <laughs> so on top of my volunteering experience. So that was another huge factor too is depending on how much free time you have and how much you would like to travel and how much you do wanna focus on maybe just your studies. Um, I think on my trip, there were people who were of both varieties who you know, wanted to either spend more time um, studying and in class or did really wanna go out and travel. So I think there's benefits to both, but when you think about your budget, that's something definitely to take into consideration and maybe plan beforehand. Like if you know where you're going, where are some of the places you wanna go and what might it cost to go there? And could you buy your ticket now? Or is it better to wait? And, and things like that were some, some of the things that I worked through um, when I was planning those excursions. Um, oh, and then something great about my program is a lot of the excursions like to the um, Sahara Desert and to a lot of the other places in Morocco, that was a part of my program um, fee. So a lot of those were already covered and taken care of. So that was another great thing about the program itself is I didn't have to worry about that because it's kind of already included, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea is to make sure you know what you're already getting and then make some plans ahead of time. Um, Rebecca, how did you manage a budget and make sure that you could spend a semester there um, within budget? Um, one thing I would say is definitely what I did, and then I kind of messed up on this. So, so like fair warning is like, look for your flight stuff ahead of time, like getting to and from the country, because the earlier you buy your tickets, like the cheaper they are. Um, also be wary of like, for me, because I was like outside of a major city. Um, I didn't know this, but like my university had a shuttle that would pick you up in Auckland and drive you the two hours south. I didn't know that. So I ended up spending way more money than I had to, to fly directly into the small airport within my city, than like fly into the major airport and then just get shuttled down. So I messed up there and spent more money than I had to. Um, but as far as like paying for like my excursions and like my other trips, New Zealand isn't as good as Morocco, but the US dollar is slightly higher. So I did have a little bit of an advantage. Um, before I went abroad, I actually worked a second job for about like six months um, because I knew I wanted to save and have a ton of money out there, which it is hard because I was doing like school full time while working two jobs. Um, but that was the way I knew I truly wanted to like be able to spend money and not really have to put myself on a huge budget. And I think one thing that helped me too is like because my aunt was in charge of my money is like she was wiring me money. So like, I didn't wire myself all of it over there. She'd wire me like $2,000 every so often. Um, but also like, instead of like completely draining my savings account that I had back here in the States, my aunt would like, because I'm lucky and like I had that support system, my aunt would be like, okay, like if we put in some of this money, like she'd help me like pay for excursions, be like, it's your time abroad. And then once I got back, I was put on a payment plan to like pay my family back. So that was one thing that really helped me is like, while I was 98% like independent paying for myself out there, I did have some of that support. Um, and like Marie said, I didn't like put myself on a huge schedule when I went abroad. I purposely was like, I'm doing the minimum amount of credits that I need to do. Um, but then also New Zealand's really nice because their grading system is a lot more lenient than the US. Like you don't need a 90% to get an A. So I was in like easy classes that didn't require as much thinking as my STEM classes typically do back here in the States. And I didn't really know, I knew that like, even though I was trying hard to like still get like what would be like a US A, I knew I had like that buffer room of like, what would be an A in New Zealand and transfer back as an A on my transcript isn't necessarily as high as a percentage as like a US one. Gotcha. Yeah, academics are different in, in different countries. And so students will often comment on the degree of difficulty of their classes. And that definitely varies from, from place to place. Um, I know I, as a student long ago, I, I also worked a lot leading up to my program, but I think it was doable because it was like a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Like I just need to put in all this effort and then I get to reap those rewards. Um, 
So that's great. Thank you guys for sharing that. I'm also curious, um, you know, this is a panel about being a first generation student abroad. Did you find that your peers on your program were also first gen students if that came up or like in any way did your identity, obviously we have multiple identities, but did part of your identity as a first gen student impact your experience, do you think in any way? And I'll, I'll have either one of you start. <laughs> If it didn't, it didn't. I'm just, I'm more so curious. Um, I guess I can go first because I can tell Marie is thinking. Um, I would say like, I don't think it ever really came up for me. Um, a lot of what I experienced in terms of like, like intersection of my identity and studying abroad came more from like my nationality and my heritage, um, especially in New Zealand. Like, people who are from the U.S. are kind of viewed on really highly because we do have like a really good education program. So I got a lot of questions related to like the U.S. politics, me as a Hispanic, like whether, you know, be, being close to the border, like how does that affect my identity of like me speaking another language? Um, it was mainly stuff about that, but never really did we talk about like um, first generation. I will say that because I took a sociology class abroad, the idea of U.S. colleges was brought up a lot because the sociology class was actually taught by a U.S. professor. So she made a lot of parallels, but that was kind of the only way in like the differences in education and like my education was brought up. Interesting. Thank you. I was just so, um, so curious. Marie, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I think something that was just noticeable for me on my program is I was very like cognizant of my finances, even though um, like I did make, you know, plan to budget accordingly. Um, I definitely did have some friends or some people in the program who that wasn't an issue. So sometimes it was a little bit difficult to either make plans or just like relate on a level sometimes um, where it's like you're trying to plan excursions and you need to be careful and just like, I think that was maybe sometimes a, an a strain or experience I had. Um, and then our professors in Morocco, we had one professor who was like very big on this idea of like studying abroad to like basically like on layman's terms, like go out and party or, you know, to study abroad and actually like immerse yourself in the culture. So we read like academic essays about that. And I think that was I think just what study abroad meant to each of us was a discussion that we all had at the beginning and the end of the semester. So I thought that was really cool that she just challenged us to think about like, hey, like, why are you here? Like, what does this experience mean to you? Um, what are your goals while you're here? And what has been impactful? So I really love that she challenged us to um, just think about that and reflect on it throughout our experience, um, both at the beginning and the end, because, you know, you kind of set, set yourself at the beginning and at the end, you get to reflect and see, you know, where you end up. But it was just cool. Just there's so many people from different backgrounds where you're coming from. So it's the same as being at university is, you know, here at ASU, there's so many people who have different backgrounds and different goals and different ambitions. So it was just really awesome. Um, just to have that support there as well. And just to connect with others and hear about those different um, backgrounds and experiences. So yeah, yeah. well said. Thanks so much. Um, I see that Anna just joined us on her break from work. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Um, Anna, do you mind introducing yourself and letting us know what you studied at ASU and where you studied abroad? Yeah. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> uh, my name is Anna de Gracias, and I just graduated from ASU last year. I graduated with a BA in communication, and I studied abroad in South Korea uh, fall 2019. Awesome. I, um, so we have a, such a variety of Morocco, New Zealand, and um, South Korea. We have different parts of the uh, world covered. That's great. Anna, I'm wondering, we'll back up to one of our earlier questions, which I just think is pretty important. Can you talk about the process of talking with your family about study abroad and what those conversations were like in terms of gaining their support for this experience? Yeah, so one of my goals right after I graduated from high school was to study abroad. It was always one of my dreams to do that. So like my, my parents are African, so they're always kind of nervous about you, like doing extra things, you know, outside of the norm. So being able to just sit down with them, I just basically told them like, here's, you know, my dream. I really want to study abroad. I'm still trying to figure out where I want to go and how I'm going to pay for it. Cause I, I wasn't able to afford it. Neither of my parents were able to afford it. So just letting, like, let, letting them know like about the different goals that I have 
and to letting them know like, oh, here's how I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to apply for scholarships. So you don't have to worry about that at all on, on your hand. So it was just like letting them know the whole entire process, uh, helping them understand the whole entire process. Because I know it's really hard for, uh, especially with the language barriers and everything, it was really hard for them to, you know, understand the whole entire process of like, okay, how is it going to work with your credits? Are you going to graduate on time? Like all those kind of questions. So those are all the things that kind of I uh, had to put into in order for my parents to kind of be like, okay, it's fine. You can go. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of information out there. We were talking about that earlier about there's just, it's almost too much, but it is all very helpful. And so sometimes I you know you do have to translate that because you live in the world of academia, you're at ASU full, full time, but your parents might not be. So it's making sure that, yeah, they are, they are on board. Um, so Anna, I know you graduated already from ASU. Can you talk about how your study abroad experience may have impacted your post ASU plans or like your academic professional goals? Definitely. So it was, I really do miss studying abroad. I wish I could go back to South Korea, but I think a lot of it, the way it helped me was being able to see like a different culture and just being in a different environment. And I was able to apply those kind of things that are the skills that I learned over there in like my, uh, career right now because I'm at, I work at Chase currently so being able to apply like you know diversity and like how you talk to different people that always come inside the bank like different people that really kind of help me with that well that's the goal of study abroad certainly is mm -hmm. to not just appreciate diversity but to understand how to communicate with others who are not from the U.S. or, or different than you right um Rebecca, you're pre-med, so you've got um, some serious plans after ASU. Can you talk about how your study abroad program has contributed to, to that plan? Yeah, so I think that if anyone else who is like pre-med, pre-law, anything like that, study abroad actually looked at like really highly on applications because such a small percent of college students in general study abroad. So putting that on your resume makes you look really good of like, I did this thing that like hardly anyone actually does. Um, so that was like one thing that's really gonna benefit me is just kind of like a talking point, um, especially for like interviews going forward. But kind of like Anna was saying is like, I'm going into a field that is so diverse and you have to have a lot of tolerance to the people that you work with. Um, and what was nice about my study abroad is like meeting people from so many different countries like I said before, a lot of my friends who like I got really close to were like of Indian heritage. Um, but that was just like coincidental. Like I knew like Kiwis or like people from New Zealand. Um, I knew someone from Iceland. So like even the job I'm in now, which is like I'm a first year success coach, I get to use that and be like, I have that experience of like working with these different populations. And like being abroad, I think like submerses you so much more in a culture because it's one thing I think being in a workplace and learning about diversity because you have to be like very conscientious, almost more of like being polite. Where like when I was abroad, because my friend group was so close, we kind of had like a no filter when it came to like asking questions about other people's cultures. Mm -hmm. So I was like really lucky in that way of like, I truly got to understand like some of the different aspects that like even weren't the positive ones. Um, so that's how I plan to use that moving forward as well. That's awesome. Yeah, one of our former peer advisors is in med school currently at the University of Michigan. But I recall when he was applying to med school, he said, I have study abroad on my resume and I get asked about it in every interview. So, and I know in applying to jobs, even outside of the study abroad office, um, it gets brought up. People think you're interesting pretty much immediately, which is nice. Um, Marie, I'm not sure what your plans are after ASU. I know you're graduating pretty soon. So, how has study abroad impacted what you might want to do? Um, I think a really impactful part of my study abroad was the service learning experience. So I got to work with a local community organization and we worked with kids mainly. It was a women's, uh, women and children's organization that focused on education um, and just like wellness. And so it was really awesome to actually be able to work um, abroad in country um, with the local community um, and at an organization where we had um, local support and just like really learned how to serve um, that community. And it was just really um, telling and just, 
educational for me too. And just like really reinforced a lot of like the career goals that I already had. Um, so as a global studies major, like one of my goals is just to really work um, abroad in international development and just like um, work with youth and children and stuff too. So that was just really an awesome experience. Um, I took uh, the Peace Corps seminar last semester. And so a lot of the things that you learn about like cultural communication, um, just like how to kind of navigate those cultural differences when you're in a situation where you not you don't necessarily understand what's going on, but you have to be able to like communicate and, and navigate those challenges. Um, and I think that was just like a really awesome, just hands-on experience being able to do that. And it definitely like everyone is saying, it's something that stands out in your resume and you just learn so many different things from it. So um, yeah, I think for me, <laughs> my plans after graduation are still, you know, up in the air. But my study abroad was has had a huge impact on just how I view what I want to do and kind of it was really affirmative, like affirming of what I wanted to do in the future as well. So that's great. It's kind of like an internship. It can um, teach you what you love and maybe what you don't love so much. You you learn a lot about yourself, certainly when you're outside of your comfort zone and your bubble. Um, how about advice? Uh, if you it doesn't have to be one piece of advice, but um, you know, Anna, thinking back on your time in South Korea, what is some, what are some major pieces of advice that you would share with this group here who are students who are planning to go abroad in the future? Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest advice would to just try to enjoy it. Like, especially the first few months, it's kind of hard because you know, you're in a different country, especially if that's your first time, you know, being traveling like, you know, that far you're away from your family. So trying to be patient with the whole entire process and tr just try to explore like different areas, enjoy it. For me, I stayed there for four months in South Korea and like the first month I wasn't used to it, I got sick. So like, I kind of like, you know, needed to take time in to enjoy like everything that I was, you know, given. Cause by the end of the four months, I was like, oh my God, I only have like, you know, one more week left. Like, no, I want to stay here longer. So just, take time, enjoy it, and um, just be in with the whole entire process. And I'll also ask, it's sort of related to an earlier question. Um, do you have advice for your, the students here who are in the planning process? Like, is there anything you wish that you had done differently when you were making plans to study abroad or that you are really mm -hmm. glad that you did while you were planning it? Yeah, one of the things that I, I did while I was planning it was just, I made a whole entire list of like the things that I needed to get done. So my advisor was Abby, she's, she's amazing. So she was able to help me out with everything that I needed help with. So I think making a list of things that you need, like, you know, the applications, the fees, how your class is gonna transfer over, like those kind of things are very, very important because you, you do wanna graduate in time and, you know, have all those credits in there. So making a list is very, very helpful. Great advice, yes, I love to-do lists. Um, and actually there's a question here for you. Um, how long were you in South Korea for? So I went fall 2019, so from August through December. So right when the pandemic hit, that's when I actually returned to the US. I was lucky because I would have been there for like, you know, I don't know how long because I came back like December 20 something uh, in 2019. So I stayed there for four months. Okay, yeah, full semester, just like Rebecca and Marie. But yes, you're right. You made it just in time back to the US. Um, Rebecca, how about you? What advice do you have to share with the students here? Oh, that's so hard. Um, I think like Anna said, like definitely giving yourself time to adjust. Um, I was so homesick like the first couple of weeks that I was debating just like giving up and flying back home. And then by the end of my program, it's like, oh, I wish I could stay here a whole year. Like if I financially and like academically could have, I would have like prolonged how long I was in New Zealand. Um, so I think definitely just like giving yourself that chance to like get used to it. And like, I guess my advice too would be what really helped me, I think, was the budgeting of like knowing that where you're going, what things will kind of be more expensive and how far your dollar goes. Um, like when I was abroad, because I was on an island, like any, like buying food was mm. so much more expensive. If you bought any clothes like new in the mall, it was like ridiculously expensive compared to the US. Um, like females, if you're taking makeup abroad, depending on where you're located in the world, like 
like drugstore makeup for the US was like $40 in New Zealand. Um, so just like looking ahead of stuff, like and like either do forums of people who have been abroad and what it's like in the country and kind of planning like what do you need to take abroad so that it's like cheaper for you and you don't have to like spend a ridiculous money to have it like shipped or like buying it there um, will actually like go a long way to help you. That's good advice. And, you know, I'll mention that, yes, you have access to myself, Barbara, our team of staff who are here to help you. But Marie mentioned this, Anna might have already, like, we're happy to try and connect you to a student who's already gone on your program. Um, it's not always possible. It does depend on if they've graduated or if they're still around. But if you do want to speak to someone who's gone through the experience and has gone to even just the country you're thinking of going to, we're happy to look into that for you. Um, Marie, what advice do you have for these guys? Um, I definitely relate to, to all of them when they said like they wish they could have stayed longer at the end because I, by that point, like after you adjust and after you're like, you're ready and you feel home, it's like, it's over. <laughs> so it's, um, it's really important to definitely like take that time and um, it's okay to be homesick too. And I think that's like, you shouldn't be like worried. Like you shouldn't be like, oh, I can't be homesick. Like it's totally normal. And I think there was one day we went to Rabat and there was a Starbucks there and it was like, it was fall. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want like Starbucks. And it was like the one Starbucks and forever. So it was so great. Just like those little reminders of home. Um, and yeah, I think another thing too, I know that I think there's a question earlier in the chat about like the best time. Um, I think some like a challenge for me, I did study abroad for the semester in the fall. I think if I could work it out, I know there was a reason I forgot it now of why I did the fall, but I think I would prefer to do if I had to do it again in the spring. I think I had some just like complications like going back in the spring to ASU, like figuring out my housing, figuring out, you know, just like adjusting back in the middle of a school year, I think was a little bit of a challenge for me. Um, I mean, that's also because the pandemic happened as well for me at the end of my study abroad experience, but um, I was lucky too, but I think that was just like, I like the spring. I had some friends who did the spring semester as well, and they were just able to have plans and, and travel after um, and not have to worry about going back to school or anything too. So it's just something to take into consideration if um, that's one of your concerns. Um, and then about finances, I wanted to mention this because I also experienced this as well. Um, when you bring your card um, with you, just look out for um, fees on your card for using the ATM or like using things like that. And if you can try and get a card before you go, that won't charge you those um, fees or exchange fees. Um, I actually went to a workshop before I left. It was like a study abroad workshop about, about budgeting, about finances, and they go through so much of that that's super helpful. So if that's something that you're wanting to do, I would definitely recommend kind of going to one of those workshops and just like learning about all the different ways um, because it's so different, especially depending on where you're going. Um, I don't know, Anna, if you use like WeChat or anything in like South Korea, but there's like so many like different ways of paying for things and different ways of, of kind of, planning that budget. So I think that was really helpful to um, attend one of those as well. Yeah. Thank you for plugging that. Yeah, Anna, what do you have to share? Yeah, I had one more thing for me. I also like Googled like blogs and stuff. People have studied abroad in South Korea, I did like YouTube videos, just so I could like kind of relate to them or like if they had any like advice that I could get from them, that's how I was able to kind of feel a little bit more comfortable and even more excited to go to that country. So that's also helpful if you want to look up different blogs or videos on YouTube. Yeah, thank you for that because our office, it's not as if ASU students are the only ones going abroad. Um, there are tons of resources out there. I, I mean, I look up resources when I travel and read people's personal blogs and watch videos. And so um, that is a great point. You guys all made points and Rebecca, I saw that you mentioned in the chat to also consider potentially the season when you go because the weather could be drastically different than what we're used to at ASU or in Arizona if you're based here. So that is something um, to definitely take into consideration. But you guys brought up just some excellent points and study abroad is a lot of planning, but it is worth it clearly because um, you guys sound like you had amazing experiences and all wish that you could have stayed a little bit longer. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention, you, you guys talked about homesickness a little bit. I'll throw it out there that even if you go on a five 
four week summer program, you can still experience homesickness, but it can just be condensed into the first maybe three or four days. So it's, um, yeah, Rebecca. Um, also, I guess advice too, if you do go abroad, that like you get homesickness and like kind of like an adjustment shot, or, like a culture shot going abroad, but you get that when you come back as well. And like, I know like study abroad talks about it, but like, I feel like people who go abroad, like don't ever mention it as much. It's like you do when you, especially if you go abroad for like a semester, maybe like not like only the four weeks, but if you're gone for several months, coming back to the US, you do kind of get like a culture shock and like you miss where you're from. So I guess just like be prepared for that as well, that like you have to kind of re-go through that adjustment, even though you're like coming back home. Yeah. Yeah. It can just take so many different forms and it can be as little as missing access to public transportation. Um, you know, if you do a summer in London uh, and then come back, it's like, oh, I wish we had the tube system here because <laughs> we have nothing and it's terrible. Um, Anna, thank you so much. I know you have to go back to work. So thank you for being here and sharing your experience in South Korea with us. Um, at this point, we've covered the questions that like, you know, we've taken from other student panels. Um, so I think we'll just open it to Q&A at this point. And it would be, I think, best if we could just enter them into the chat um, or at least start there. And then if you would also like to unmute yourself, you can. But looks like we have one from Dakota. Um, did you use a debit card or did you take out cash and then phone plans? Like, what did you guys do? So, um, Marie, can you talk about that first? Yeah, definitely. Um, I use both card and cash. So I used um, my mid first card actually when I was in Morocco, there was a fee, but it was just the easiest for me to just keep it in that one. Um, and then also I brought a credit card, but they visa works best. I brought a discover card, which I knew was a bad idea, but it just did not work. So just know like what cards will work in what country like that you're going to, that's important to know. Um, and then I, you can have the option of like exchanging currency before you leave. I just chose to do it when I was, um, in Morocco. Um, and my ISA had its own um, kind of orientation where they walked us through some of those things and they told us just wait till you get here, it'll be fine. Um, and you had the option to open up a bank account when you're in Morocco, but I didn't do that either just because I was only there for the semester. I think that maybe starts to look different if you're staying for a year um, or longer. And then um, phone plans, what was really good about my program is we have just really, really great um, on-site uh, Moroccan um, just staff and program coordinators. And we got there and they walked us over to the phone place and helped us get new SIM cards and phone numbers. Um, and I had an iPhone, so it was very easy. It was like unlocked and I just put a new SIM card in and it was, it worked great. So um, it was just really easy. And I think the only other thing about phone plans is that data, you do have to pay for data. It's not just like unlimited, like it is here with your own phone plan. So definitely connect to Wi-Fi as much as you can. And that's kind of what enables you, especially at airports and stuff when you're in between countries or not sure where you are, Wi-Fi is great. <laughs> so um, yeah. and very easy to use. So. Yeah. Traveler's best friend, Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, Rebecca, how about you with debit cards, cash, phone plans? Um, so I kind of did like opposite of what Marie did. So I went and like I said before, like I was lucky of like my aunt travels abroad a lot for work. So she has like, I'm gonna say like a nice credit card where like you don't really get fees for like being abroad. So because I didn't have my own credit card at the time, I just got added on to hers and she put like a travel notice so that I could swipe it abroad. Um, so that was like kind of like, if I needed to make a large purchase, I could just like put it on her card. Um, as far as like debit cards, I pulled money. Again, I did opposite of Marie. So I like converted some money. I think I converted about $2,000 before I went abroad. And then that was like my, until I got like set up, like I could just pay cash for whatever. Um, and then once I was abroad, I just opened a bank account because like the university I was at was kind of like ASU. They had like an affiliated bank on campus. Um, so for me, it was really easy to just like open a checking account and close one. Um, so that's what I did as far as like banking and stuff like that goes, because then it was also easier for me of like 
like I had to wire myself money, which kind of sucks if you do open an account abroad because A, you do get like charged a fee for wiring internationally. Um, but it was like an easier way for me to like manage my money than just like keep swiping and like not really know what I was spending. Um, as far as my phone plan goes, I was really lucky because of my university, like being a study abroad student, they provided me with a SIM card. So I just had to like pay for the plan. Um, so like, the one that they gave us, you get like so much free data um, and it gives you like New Zealand number. However, I will say this happened to me, make sure your phone is like able to be unlocked before you went abroad because we forgot to do that for me. So my phone wasn't paid off and my family had to like rush pay off my phone. And like, I had to awkwardly like wait in limbo for a day until like AT&T recognized it was unlocked. So I could like switch the SIM card over. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to be done um, preparation wise and for things like that, unlocking your phone or figuring out, are you just going to use it when you're connected to Wi-Fi and then buy a little flip burner phone when you get there. Um, and then money wise, I'll just, I'm glad you actually both did different things regarding opening a bank account, not opening an account, checking with your uh, banks to make sure you know the different fees. Um, it can really take a lot of forms. And I do think too, your plans will be influenced by how long you're there. So we try to provide you as much information as we can about that in our orientation that's on Canvas when you do get to the point where you're planning, you're, you're committed to a program and you're going abroad. But um, yeah, definitely consult all, all of your resources. It looks like we might have time for one more question. Um, if anyone wants to enter that into the chat. Those saying thank you, you are so welcome. Thank you for joining us today and being here to listen to Marie, Anna and Rebecca's experiences. Hopefully this was helpful for you in planning to go abroad. I have a quick question that I just think is gonna be easier to say instead of type. Um, so we have our academic advisor like for our college. Is that the same person we can talk to for study abroad or is there like a different advisor for that? Yeah, so you're like you're as well as class. With, you'll have to work with both. So your academic advisor, as um, Marie and Rebecca can attest to, help you figure out okay, what courses do you have to take to stay on track for graduation in general, and then the study abroad office and people like myself and Barbara can help you figure out okay, does that program offer those classes? So you know we're kind of working hand in hand, and you as a student will work with us on that too. So everyone's involved, but I like to start with the advisor because they have access to things like your DARS report, your graduation plan, they know your major math. Whereas then if you come to us and say, okay, I can take anything I want, well, awesome. Or if you come to us and say, okay, I can take anything that's upper division political science. I can also make sure that you're identifying a program that is going to allow you to do that. So I hope that helps. Okay. Um, I would also say just out of my own experience, if you're on any sort of like pre career track, definitely getting in contact with those advisors. So like pre law pre med. Um, I know we have other like pre career advisors, I just don't know what they are. Um, making sure that those not requirements that you have to hit, like, like I said, like you have to take all your credits within the US or anything like that. Um, also, I know like the pre-med advisors tend to like recommend you study abroad within like the first two years, even though it's like not really necessary and I didn't do that. Um, but they can sometimes like guide you more with stuff like that if it's needed. Okay, that, thank you. That's true. They can help you figure out a good time to go um, for your major. So really great questions, Marie, Rebecca, thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you all know our website. Barbara, can you just drop the website address into the chat? That is our main website. Feel free to peruse all the resources that um, we've mentioned today, attend a financing workshop, attend a study abroad 101, reach out to our staff. We have a whole contact page with all of our pictures and our office hours. So Barbara just dropped the website in the chat. Um, please do reach out, we're here to help you and plan as you 
you're already here at ASU. I, I said it in the beginning, it's an accomplishment, but we do want to send you abroad and help you take that next step. So we, we are here to help you do that. And we have a first generation students page that Barbara also just dropped. So a page dedicated to you, dedicated to parents, um, almost anything you need is, is online. So with that, um, I will again say thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at another workshop. Everyone have a good rest of your day. Bye.